Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is July 10th, 2001, and this morning we're pleased to have with us James McCarthy. Jim, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us. Thank you. May I ask you how old you are? 80. 80 years old and your current address? Marlboro, Massachusetts. Marlboro, Mass. And your marital status? I'm widower. A widow? Do you have widower? Do you have children? I had three children. How about grandchildren? I've got three grandchildren. Shall we try for great grandchildren? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Where were you born, Jim? I was born in Boston. In Boston? Mm -hmm. And were you raised there? I was raised in South Boston. Um, can you tell us about your parents, your mom and dad, what they did? As a what? What they did. What, what did your dad do? My dad was a uh, stationary engineer. He worked at Harvard College and supplied their heating systems and, and air conditioning. Mother was just a housewife. She didn't work. And she had nine. I had eight brothers and sisters, so she didn't have much time to go. Pretty to work. large family. Pretty, uh, yeah. What was the uh, South Boston like when you grew up there? Tell us about the streets, the kids, the schools. The school. Well, I went to a parochial school. The schools were fairly well. South Boston was a tough town uh, at that time. All the men worked down at the the army base and the. The docks is longshoremen, so they had to stand up to their reputations. It was a, uh, it, was a it was a good good place to be brought up. I, I, I enjoyed it, and but I w soon left there after after the war because of the the reputation it had. <laughs> Just before the war, you're you're in school in. Uh in South Boston, Massachusetts? No, I didn't go to school in Southie. That's another, I went to the English High School, which was in, in Greater Boston. Okay. And uh, I didn't do, do very much school, and I, was, uh, I worked on the Boston Main Railroad when I was 16 years old, helping to support my family, uh, the family I lived with. So I didn't, get, I didn't graduate from high school at that time. Uh, I joined the National Guard, if you want to, joined the National Guard in 1939, principally to get some money so I could buy a, buy some, a suit. <laughs> and money was kind of scarce in those days. 1939 was before Pearl Harbor, right. or the United States getting involved in the war. Right. Uh, and you're in the National Guard now. What did you do in the Guard? In the Guard, I was a, was a private in, in the Infantry Company L. And we were activated in January 1941. This was um, the threat of war in Europe, and uh, Rose President Roosevelt uh, decided to uh, give a one-year training to the National Guard, and we, I ended up at uh, Camp Edwards, Massachusetts in January 1941. What does being activated mean? That you just go and join the Army? Is oh, that, no, is no, no, no. They just, I was in the National Guard, so we were members of a military operation, mm -hmm. and, the, and the President just said, you're active, and so we became uh, full-time military people. Still, still in the National Guard? Still in, what? Still in the National Guard, yes. But, and what did you do at Camp Edwards? At Camp Edwards, we went into full training as a, as a division, with the 26th Division. That's the Yankee Division? Yankee Division, yeah. Tell us what kind of training you had. All military training, which was uh, squad movements, and regimental movements. And uh, we went to South Carolina maneuvers, which were field maneuvers for large groups. And which was strictly infantry infantry training, as far as I was concerned. All of us have looked at what's all, that? All of us have looked at uh, old newsreels of the, those days, and guys were uh, walking around with a, a sign that says "I'm a tank," <laughs> or they had sticks because they had no rifles. Were you guys well equipped? No, uh, no. Tell us about the equipment you had. Well, we, we were using trucks with a sign on it for tanks at, at Camp Edwards. Uh, we did have the uh, Garand rifle, 
when it came out. I've forgotten when it came out. We had 1903s to begin with, and then we got Garands. So we did we did train with Garands. Uh, we didn't have any air force to speak of, so we never we never learned anything about uh, infantry air combinations of, for fighting. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know anything about that. But, uh, and we didn't see much of tanks, so we couldn't learn anything about uh, tank training. When you were called up into active service, right? Were you kind of alone, or were you with other people you knew? Yeah, I was with the same National Guard outfit so that you, I had joined two years before. You were not a stranger. You knew yeah. all these guys. Yeah. Same thing in South Carolina. You knew all these people. Well, yes. Well, I was with the same unit. We were down there. We were down there. The whole division went down. Where were you? At Fort Jackson or where? We were in the boondocks. I don't know where the hell it was. It was the, just the military training area down there. Had you ever been south before? No. No. First was this kind of a culture shock for you? Uh, no, because we didn't see much of the population. <laughs> it was all trees and, and jungle. Looking back a long time later at that kind of training, did you feel it was good training or, God, you wish it had been a lot better? Uh, I wish it had been a lot better. You didn't Because have we were, well, I hate to say this, but we were National Guard and the officers above the rank of, of the lieutenant platoon commander were political appointees and our, our company commander was the was the commissioner of water in the, in the, in the town of Malden and what he knew about military strategy was would fill a, a tumble I guess and so and, and they didn't learn that fast and it, it takes a lot of experience to be infantry trained, I mean a lot of experience. And they just simply didn't have it and then we didn't have time to get it. This was 1941, about what time? How long did this last? Well, I was in, in, in the Army a year before the war started, so we had a year of training. So where were you on Pearl Harbor Day? At Pearl Harbor, uh, we were coming back, we had come back from the South Carolina maneuvers and I was with the, the advance guard and we landed in Camp Edwards and I was the only one that had a radio and when the radio come on Sunday morning and announced Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese, everybody was running around trying to find out where the hell Pearl Harbor was. We didn't, nobody knew. <laughs> and at that time the mothers and fathers of the of the kids in the division were coming into Camp Edwards to see their, their sons and, and their husbands. Uh, so we were, we were pretty shocked when, when Pearl Harbor came. Was it your expectation at the end of that year that you would go back to uh, civilian Go back to my life? job, sure. Yeah. Sure. And now all of a sudden this thing called Pearl Harbor comes along. All right. And your division commander got up one morning and said to you what? Well, he got up one morning and said, well, hey, we're going to war. We ended up, uh, a week later, we ended up on the coast of Maine uh, on coastal duty. Uh, we shot up a few fishermen. <laughs> the Germans never got there that quick. And, and uh, then we were pulled back from, the, from uh, coastal duty and we, we went to New York and got on board the ship and went to Australia. That's kind of fast, isn't it? It is. We were, we were in Australia in February of 1942. So within um, two months of Pearl Harbor, you're already overseas. You're no, in the South well, Pacific. Well, two months after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. 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 You're already overseas. Well, that's right, right. And most of America is just waking up to the fact that... Just waking up there in a war. Mm -hmm. Tell us about going to Australia. It took you a while. <laughs> There's a million stories about the boat. Tell us. We were couple. on board the, the SS Argentina, which was a uh, pleasure ship cruising South America from the United States. And it was converted to a troop ship in a very short space of time. And as a result, there were no amenities on board ship. Uh, the latrines, there were no latrines. There were, we were still using the toilet facilities that were there when it was a passenger ship. And we were in a cabin that originally was built for two or three people, and it had 15 men in it. 
And <laughs> chow line started at six o'clock and ended at five o'clock. And you were lucky if you got two meals a day out of there. Did you sleep in shifts? What's that? Did you sleep in shifts? Uh, no, but they had bunks rising up to the, to the ceiling, there, but there was only about a foot and a half yeah. between each bunk. Then we had all our barracks bags in there, and our packs and our rifles and helmets and everything else, and it was a pretty wild mess. But we were able to, yeah, if you could sleep in there, it was so hot. It, but we, we got along, you know, because it was an adventure. We were, we were heading up. We were on board ship for the first time. We had, I'd never been on board ship before. The ship left New York Harbor, went down through the Panama Canal, out to the Panama Canal, and there were submarines out there, Japanese submarines. As a matter of fact, we saw them dropping depth bombs. I don't know whether they ever hit anything. And then they diverted us down to South America, and then we were at the Tasmanian Sea. We went over the Tasmanian Sea to Melbourne, Australia. 31 days <laughs> it took us. Did, did you stop any place no. uh, out in the Pacific? No, no. Just right straight to, to Melbourne, Australia. And <laughs> this is not a pleasant thing to tell, but on board, 5,000 men on board ship, uh, they served us some chicken, and I, no, it was turkey, that had been left in the docks while they were loading it, and it had uh, defrosted, and then they put it on board ship, they froze it again. And when they served it, everybody got dysentery. <laughs> 5,000 men on board that ship with dysentery and no latrine facilities. It was a horrible mess. Well, I guess we can quit right there. <laughs> <laughs> when you were sailing over uh, overseas, uh, you were with, again, with people you knew. Yes. Um, but you'd never been on a ship before. No. And now suddenly you're in a place called Australia, Melbourne. How were you? Uh, how were you greeted at Melbourne? We were greeted very well, uh, but we only we got off the uh, the boat and hopped on a train, and we ended up in a in an uh, Australian army camp. So we didn't get very, didn't get any opportunity to see the uh, civilians. We we saw just the army personnel at the uh, the uh, army army camp. And what outfit were you in now? That was Company L, 182nd Infantry, 26th Division. Okay. How long were you around Melbourne? Uh, about a week. Yeah, a week. And from there we went, we on board a ship again, and we went to Noumea, New Caledonia. We were the first troops in Australia, we were the first American troops in Noumea. And I was detached again my company, along with M Company, left Noumea and went to Ifati in the New Hebrides. And uh, our mission was to warn Noumea if the Japanese attacked Ifati. Uh, and if they came ashore, we were to go to the hills and wait until we were rescued. <laughs> that's, that's what you were told to do. <laughs> that's what we were told to do, right. Specifically, what was your job? You were an infantry man. I was an infantry. I was an infantry. You're carrying a, a grand an M1 rifle. Right, right. And so that you were a pure grunt. That's right. Pure That's grunt. what you were doing. That's right. But you were sent to an island to warn other islands if the Japanese came along. Right. Tell us about going to Pacific Islands. You're a guy from South Boston. <laughs> what was it like? It was it was a terrific experience, of course. And. Uh, we were, to go from Noumea to Ifati, we were aboard the Australian battle cruiser. It wasn't a battle cruiser, Westralia. It was a merchant ship that had been converted to a military ship and had a gun on it, and the gun was so long that it couldn't pull the barrel inside the ship. They had to climb out on the gun over the water to, to clean the barrel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it, that was an experience, of course, of meeting Australian s s sailors, and uh, that was an it was. It's only an overnight trip from Noumea to uh, Ifadi, so we didn't we weren't there very long. But we landed on Ifadi. It was a jungle island. There was nothing there. Well, I'm sorry. The, 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 it was the city of Ifadi. Probably had uh, three thousand people in it, but we didn't stay in the town. Actually, we went out immediately. Went out to the outskirts and. Uh, we were on outposts around the island, 
And here we had a lot of fun with the natives. We built fake guns uh, and mounted them on uh, stands. To, and then we put camouflage over them to make it look like we had six inch guns uh, uh, ready to shoot in case the Japanese attack. And the natives got a big kick out of that. <laughs> and we did too. <laughs> what was your contact with the enemy? There was no, airplanes? no, no contact. Were there overflies, bombing uh, raids? Submarine once came in and, and uh, shelled us. That's all at Ifadi. When we went to we went to Espiritu Santo, which was another step up the chain toward Guadalcanal. We were to build an airport, and uh, the infantry building an airport kind of sounded stupid, and it was. But we started anyway, and we were there I think a couple of weeks, and the, the Marine CB battalion came in, and then it took over the airport, and uh, eventually it landed uh, uh, B-17s. And some of the fighter planes off the Wasp landed there when the Wasp was sunk. But they, from there they could bomb Pearl, uh, Guadalcanal, which they did in other islands north of Guadalcanal. On Guadalcanal, I, I was uh, no. Let, let's not get there yet. No, no, no. On Espirito <coughs> Santo, my my job ended up uh, recruiting natives to work on the on the airport. What they were doing was, was strictly manual labor type of thing, but they would only work for 30 days and you had to bring them back to wherever they, were, they had picked them up. And so it was a constant struggle to keep enough natives there to do any of the work to get the airport done. But the Marines came in and they wanted the, they came over with, with equipment so they were doing a, a pretty good job. Uh, so they didn't need a lot of natives then. And this strip was big enough for B-17s, you said? That's right. Yeah. How far away were you from Guadalcanal? Uh, in, uh, uh, in Espirito Santo, there were about uh, 200 miles, 150 miles, within air, air range. It wasn't that far. Now, the Marines invaded uh, Guadalcanal in August, uh, first week in August, 5th, 6th, and 7th, something like that. Right. August 7th. Uh, what did you hear about that? Because it was the first major invasion in the war. Well, we heard that they had landed, uh, but uh, the details were, little, were, were very sketchy. We knew they had fight and they were, they were having a tough time, but that's all we learned. We didn't know too much. And here again is another complaint I had about they didn't, the information never got down to me, never mm -hmm. got down to the one man on, the, on with a rifle. He, didn't, he never learned enough about what, what was going on in the whole picture. Let's go from there to asking about your officers. Uh, the, were these the same officers who yes. uh, were the water uh, yes. manager for some town in Massachusetts? Yes. So how good were they at military operations now? They're out in the field. That's right. And that's what my complaint, is, complaint about is they, they didn't know what they were doing. And they were learning, maybe learning it, it along with us, but uh, we didn't, we didn't know we had war. We were in maneuvers, is, is, is what we thought. And you didn't know you had a, in a war until it starts, some bullets started to fly, so nothing was fine. So we were having an adventure. And so training for actual combat was, you know, minuscule. You're working your way up toward the middle of 1942 here. Um, uh, still 1942, because they landed in Guadalcanal in 42. Yeah. Um, at what point did your officers uh, get told to shape up by somebody else who realized that you guys are going into the war, r the real war? What happened to change your outfit? Well, I think just the experience of being there, the jungle experience for one. Uh, Espirito Santo was nothing but jungle. There was no, no cities there, no towns just a few villages, and we built an airport there. There were no landing facilities. I remember when they brought gasoline in and 55-gallon drums, they threw the drums over the side of the ship and we had to go around swimming and get the, the, the drums onto a landing craft and bring them ashore because there were no docks. 
and uh, getting food to show was tough. We had to be dropped into, into landing craft and then taken to shore and, and taken off the landing craft. Japanese spotter pa uh, planes by now must have seen you people oh, and the they knew we were there, yes. Did they come bombing you or? They, they bombed us with a submarine and they had one, uh, one attack by aircraft. The Secretary of Defense came to visit us and they sent an airplane down and tried, tried to bomb our facilities, uh, but it was nothing to speak of. The only thing that had in Espirito Santo, the uh, SS Argentina, which was a cruise ship, well, I told you the ship that. you came over on. I, yeah. uh, no, no, this I'm sorry. The President Coolidge uh, came from the United States loaded with brand new equipment for us at Espirito Santo and hit one of our own mines. It sank, right? In the, and it sank right in the harbor, yeah. yeah. And uh, luckily all the men got off, but all the equipment went to the bottom. I got a letter from an Australian after the war and said they had taken the the gasoline off that ship and sold it and made a few bucks. <laughs> there are very famous pictures uh, showing that thing right in the harbor, going right to the bottom. Is that so? Oh yeah. I haven't even seen those. Yeah. I think right about now, uh, your outfit has been told that you're going to Guadalcanal. Right. Okay. Well, Tell us about that. Uh, our rest of our division, which was still in Numea, went to Guadalcanal before we did, because we were on separate duty with the same mission we had on Esperino, uh, Esperino Santo as we had on Ifadi, was just to warn Numea if the Japanese landed in Esperino Santo. So the rest of our division was already on Guadalcanal, and they had now accumulated uh, the 164th Infantry, which was a National Guard out from, from uh, North Dakota, and the 132nd Infantry, which was another National Guard uh, regiment from ch uh, Chicago. And now they put the three of them together and called us the Americal Division. They never gave us a number. We were the only division in the Army that never had a number. And uh, uh, we were the Americal, and now they were on Guadalcanal, um, Shortly after, after the, uh, well, not shortly after, it was a little while after the Marines landed before the Army got up there. They didn't really want us. They, they wanted to make that completely Marine operation, so they, they weren't anxious for the Army to come in, but we did. And uh, eventually we landed at Guadalcanal and we just joined our, our, our regiment, which are now a division. You did something that very few people in the, in the world ever did. You went ashore on an island that was in, in combat. Right. Tell us about pulling up there for your really first genuine combat experience. What was it like getting off the ship and going ashore in Guadalcanal? Well, it, uh, actually it was a, a new experience. and. Uh, I really didn't think much about combat, except and we were in it. And uh, the amount of actual contact with the Japanese for us was minor. Uh, we were attacked once. We were defending the airport. Henderson Field. Yeah, and, uh, Henderson Field. More, all the activity of the military on Guadalcanal was to protect the air, airfield. Once they got the airfield, they set up a defensive line and they just stayed there. The Japanese kept attacking that line in order to get to the airport, uh, but they never broke through. And when we came ashore, we did the same thing. We were just put on the line and relieved some marine outfits so that they could go back and get some rest. And the attacks by that time had diminished and they were simply trying to stay alive, survive, and so attacking us was not a, a big deal. They attacked us once and we, we fought them off and uh, that's where I got wounded once uh, with, with a shell fragment. And but that was it, it was over. We, we shot them all up and we were, we were big heroes. <laughs> Stories about Guadalcanal at that time are often of night raids or battleships oh, or cruisers yeah, firing yeah. at you. Were you on the receiving end yeah. of any of that? Yes. What's it like to get shot at by a cruiser? 
You stand underneath the bridge while a train goes over it, you'll get the idea of what it's like. They were shooting large caliber shells, but they were shooting at the airport. And we were outside the airport, a good distance from the airport. So the shells went over us, but they never never, never hit us. But we were, we were deep in foxholes, believe me, because uh, it was a terrible sounding thing. And the shells were landing, we could hear the explosions landing on the, uh, trying to land on the airport. But it, uh, it didn't, they didn't ever accomplish much, as far as I could see. And of course, we weren't privileged to see everything anyway. Were you close enough to the field to see the planes coming and going? No, no. No, I, well, I, I seen the field and that was it. Uh, one time we were on uh, Heartbreak Ridge and the Japanese bombed the airport and the airplanes came around. We were on the bridge here and the airplanes came around here and I saw the one Japanese plane going back to his base. I shot at him with my rifle, but I never accomplished anything. That's where Edson's Raiders were on that ridge? Edson's Raiders? Edson's. No, they, they were formed there, but they didn't do anything on Gordon Canal. They were, went from there to somewhere else. Uh, wait a minute now. What? No. There's another Raiders. What, who are the other Raiders? That's okay. It's just you no. were on historic ground and... There was another uh, bunch that were volunteers they got from Guadalcanal who ended up in, in Asia, in, uh, uh, in India, all around. and they traveled into in China uh, and they fought the Japanese there. I forgot what their names were. You may be thinking of Merrill's uh, Merrill's Marauders. Yeah. Merrill's Marauders. That was, that was the Burma campaign. That's right. Burma th campaign. That's a tough bunch of guys too. Yeah, that, yeah they were. They had a tough time with sickness. I think it was more than more than, than mm -hmm. the Japanese uh, uh, military. So you you fired a, J a Japanese plane. I fired a Japanese you, plane. You got that satisfaction. Okay. Huh? <laughs> yeah. How long were you on Guadalcanal then? We, we left there about February of 1942, and we went back to the Fiji Islands. And from the Fiji Islands, I was selected to go to OCS, and I came back to the States. Now, give us a date for that. The date? The yeah. dates, I haven't got them with me right now, but maybe around March, I left and came back to the States, and I... Of 43. 40. 42, 43, yes, yeah, okay. 43. March of 43. And then I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and OCS training. I must have graduated from there for March, April, May, uh, that was about June or July. You were a 90 day wonder? 90 day wonder, yeah. You told us earlier that you dropped out of school to work for the. Say that again. You told us earlier that you had dropped out of school at 16. Right to go to work on the Boston and Main Railway. Right, right. Here you're being selected by the United States Army to go to OCS. Right. You must have shown them something. Uh, did you take tests? Why did they pick you to go to OCS? I was a good soldier. And that's what they were looking for. They were looking for infantry leaders. With a Purple Heart now. I had a Purple Heart. Yeah. yeah. And they were looking for infantry leaders and so they were glad to get me because uh, infantry lieutenants don't last long. How many men from your outfit were chosen to do this? No more than two, I don't think. You and another guy? It didn't come with me, not then, then later on, but he yeah. went to Australia for, for OCS. Now you're back in Georgia yeah. with Guadalcanal under your belt. Yeah. Tell us about what in 90 days turns you into a first lieutenant, second lieutenant. Well, we, we got a, a lot of training as a second lieutenant because of map reading and, and compass reading and, and um, strategy, how to combat infantry with a platoon because we're going to be a platoon leader now. Uh, but we didn't get too much beyond the platoon operation, in other words, company and battalion and regimental strategies. But we got a lot of good training down there. Although the, uh, the combat training wasn't the greatest. Uh, when in Guadalcanal, we were, we were going through the jungle and 
if you go through the jungle and try to find somebody, believe me, it's a tough job. And they should have gotten, gotten more of that. But of course, we're going to Europe. Uh, there's a whole different story, a different, different war altogether. Up to Guadalcanal, you, you said quite clearly that your leadership had been just fairly yeah, good, uh, but uh, now you, you're up in the big leagues. Yeah. You're a leader yourself, but right. you're being trained by men who'd been through the war college. What are some of the, the strategies that they talk to you about? And how do you move a platoon around under combat? That's a tough job. And they never did train me or, or show me how to move a platoon under combat condition. Because once you let once you let a platoon get out, a squad get out of your yelling distance, how do you keep in touch with them? And this is what I found: the radios they had were absolutely useless. I had radios all the way through the goddamn war, and they never worked when I wanted them. Mm -hmm. And so you had to send runners, and I I used runners and had them disappear on me over in Europe anyway. They disappeared and I, I never, I don't even know where they were, what happened to them even today. And this was my main, I still don't know how to handle uh, communications between a, a second lieutenant and his squads. I don't know, even today. Well, you're 80, so you better find out. They <laughs> better find out pretty soon, huh? <laughs> You and I talked before this interview. What's that saying? <clears throat> you and I talked before this interview, and I said to you that it's pretty rare for a, a, a fellow to have gone to Guadalcanal, and now you're on your way to Europe. Tell us about you're out of you're, you've got the bar on your shoulder now. Uh, did you get a chance to go home? Yes, I got I got to leave at <clears throat> home. Uh, I don't forgotten how much it was. It wasn't very long, and I reported. I reported to my uh, new duty station was the 84th Division in New Orleans, uh, uh, Louisiana. And when I got there, I report to my uh, commanding officer. They were in the field, and I was dressed up in my brand new uniform. <laughs> and I reported to the field, and in my dress uniform, I, that was miserable. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that takes care of another cleaning bill right there. <laughs> what were you told to do when you reported for duty? Well, uh, they just told me, you're a platoon commander, and they put me in charge of a platoon. Uh, the Cannon Company and a few other rifle companies were fighting for me. They wanted a, a veteran in their operation, and the L Company won, which was another infantry company. And they put me in charge of the uh, the weapons platoon. A weapons platoon. Okay, now a platoon is attached to another platoon. Well, they're in it, and a rifle and company. Then, then you go up to a battalion strength, and you move well, up and become and a corps company and of army. Four platoons. Yeah. Three rifle platoons and a weapons platoon, and, there are, and then there are three rifle companies and a battalion along with a weapons company, and there are three battalions and a regiment along with a artillery division, a regimental artillery. What new things did you have to learn uh, to be a, an officer in a weapons platoon? Well, I had to learn how to, how to aim a 60-millimeter mortar and, and how to deploy them, how to use them in combat. And I had to learn the, the light, 30 caliber light machine gun, because we had two of those, three mortars, two, two machine guns. And these were usually attached to platoons, or they could be used entirely by themselves. So we had to learn that strategy and when to, when to uh, attach the guns to another platoon or when to keep them to yourself. So this was something that had to be learned. And it was all, it's all experience, believe me, it's all experience. And you learned this in, in around uh, Louisiana? Right. Okay, and where did you go from there? From Louisiana, we went to, to Europe, and we, we took a train ride to uh, New Jersey. Forgotten the name of the port, and, and another experience. We left uh, to go to Europe, and our ship was struck by another ship, and then we had to go back into port again. And we stayed there a week while they repaired it. I got to New York City this time, though. <laughs> <laughs> About what was the, your sailing date to go overseas to Europe? 
I don't remember the exact date. I'd have to get my books out to, to get the... Somewhere in 43? Uh, it, it was after D-Day. D-Day was, was May, so June, July. So you're up to About 40? August we landed in, uh, and we landed at, Numa, at Normandy. In, in 44? No, oh, same year, 43. 43. When was D-Day? 44. Was it 44? Yeah. June the 6th. Okay, I, I lost the year in there someplace. <laughs> yeah, we, well then we landed in Europe about uh, September, August or September of that year. And... Uh, where, did, where did you land in Europe? Normandy. At Normandy? Yeah. And you went over, sea, over sh land from there tw toward what objective? Well, there, there was another experience, uh, another situation. When I was in, <coughs> in England, they had detached me from the company and put me in charge of a, a unit that was going to become a part of the Red Ball Express. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the Red Ball Express? Would you describe it for us, please? What's that? Would you tell us about it, yeah. what it is? The Red Ball Express was, was set up so that trucks going to the front wouldn't be stopped going through France. Where when the front moved, the, these trucks had a direct route from the, because there was no port. We had no port yet. We were still landing everything on the beach. Everything was coming in over through, over through Normandy. So the trucks would, would just go in convoy and go up this road all the way to the front without being stopped and then turn around and come back was on another road that was kept open for the return trucks to do the same thing. They come back and get another load and go back up to the front again. Well, I was detached with a 30-man uh, a, uh, group. We had 30 trucks loaded and we were on board ship and we were sent to uh, Normandy to load, unload. And while we were anchored at Normandy, a storm came up and the rhino raft that we, that we were loading with our trucks started to heave up and up and down by the side of the ship and I got a little worried so I pulled all the my men off of the off the raft. I don't know what happened to the sailors who were manning the raft, but a rhino raft is a huge steel uh, unit with, with big engines on the rear end. They had two diesel engines on the rear end. But anyway it broke loose and thirty boat thirty trucks loaded with Merchandise went to the bottom of the of the of Normandy Beach, so you go there. You can probably find all that stuff there now. <laughs> probably so. Yeah. Are you then so out of a job, or do they give you another thirty no, trucks? No, what no I had another. No, no more, no more jobs. I was told to go back to my outfit. I landed in France, and nobody wanted me. We had a, I had to take my the men I had, and we we slept in a Napa lodge until I could get somebody who would who would do something. And then we were, I went, we were shipped to Cherbourg where my outfit was and we joined up and then I went back to my division again. What happened after that? Cherbourg is pretty, pretty well beat up. Yeah. And we went right straight to the front line, right from Cherbourg, right straight to the front line. Tell us about that, please. So we, they, they separated us and attached us to different units that are already on the line. The idea being to acquaint us with the noise of the line and the, and the activity that was going on. So we were attached to the 30th Infantry, I believe it was. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the town that we were in. Uh, and we were immediately put on the line and then we started to learn about uh, how to record artillery blast so that they could determine where the guns were and to send up, we went on several patrols to try to locate uh, German resistance points and usually at night, and in fact at night. And then we used, we used searchlights, bounce the searchlights off the clouds to light up the, the battlefield so that we could tell if German patrols were coming in or not. So this was all a new experience. and. Uh, uh, it was quite good attaching us to a, a, a seasoned comp outfit. And this outfit went, in, went on the attack and what they did was uh, went around us uh, attacking the Germans and we were left uh, defending uh, an area which a pillbox area and then we were 
uh, order to attack the food pillbox area and to clean out the pillboxes. And uh, in my history book, I got a I got a paragraph, and they were my name telling me <laughs> attacking the pillboxes. <laughs> Tell us about that. Tell what. How do you attack a pillbox? Good God, I still don't know. <laughs> we attacked it, a straight frontal attack with the 37 millimeter gun aimed at the aperture. These pillboxes were dug into hills and they were practically, you couldn't even see them, but they, they were tremendous pieces of, a, of, of cement. And we went straight in and there was nobody in the pillbox. So we were lucky, but when I found out what the pillboxes were like, uh, I, I, I was amazed. They were mostly underground, and uh, around the doors they, were, they had an opening where they, uh, you could get into the inside of the pillbox, and the pillbox would hold about 30 men who were sleeping, and they had one uh, separate arrangement for the, pill, for the aperture in which they had a gun, but that was separate from the main from the main uh, pillbox, and you had to go leave that uh, that uh, gun aperture to get to the pillbox. Oh, I, I remember I was on top of the pillbox and I dropped a grenade down uh, an opening I thought was an opening, but it was uh, it was an air air duct, but it was made in such a way as that it ended up at the bottom of the pillbox and the grenade landed outside amongst my own men because it didn't go inside they had we didn't know that until, until I went through that thing and uh, it's steel doors on this pillbox three steel doors they had apertures so that as you went into the entrance way the gun could shoot you as you were coming in and you had to go through a steel door to another entrance and you another steel door into the main entrance so it was quite a place to get into if there were anybody in there to try to stop you because there was nobody there in this pillbox, and uh, we attacked uh, three more pillboxes and with the same results. But the fourth pillbox was loaded with Germans, and they put up a defense. And uh, to get to this pillbox was about 300 yards, and they had uh, in a beet field, and uh, we know I don't know where they have beets in this country like that, but they the beets are grown on the ground. And to walk over them, you, it's almost impossible. You, they slip in, because of the dew and everything, the water. You slip and slide like, like you were on an ice skating rink. And we, and these were 300 yards, and they were had sharpshooters. I lost two men there, uh, direct hits, right, right, right through the, the forehead. And so I didn't attack any farther until my old man would give me some, some support. And even then, I didn't know what <clears throat> support I wanted because now the the troops were outside the pillbox and uh, fighting from uh, pill, from foxholes, so we didn't get them that night or that day, and we went back. <clears throat> but they sent us out at night to get the, that pillbox that the Germans had left again, so I was a little bit lucky, and we got nine to ten pillboxes without uh, having to do any frontal fighting. Except I went to frontal fighting, but there was nobody there, so we were lucky. We were lucky. You said initially you had a 37 millimeter cannon. Is that enough to tackle a pillbox? No. That's a kind of small gun, isn't it? That's nothing, yeah. But if you, if you realize that it's an only an opening, and if they got a gun in there, what size gun have they got? They'd usually probably have a, a you know, machine gun, or they might even have a, another anti-tank gun of some sort, which would only be small, 37 millimeter. So, but our 37s at that time were obsolete, and uh, they, we, they weren't any good against anything. On Guadalcanal, we used the 37s with canister shot, and this was like a large shotgun, which was, mm -hmm. uh, which was a hell of a gun. But in Germany, it was useless. And they carried it around and set them up, but I don't think they ever you could do much with them because he certainly couldn't hit a Tiger tank or, or a, uh, the, the other Panther tank. You could hit it, but it wouldn't do much good. Wouldn't do anything. Yeah. It didn't, wouldn't bother it at all. I'm, I'm kind of lost as to where you are. Were you anywhere near the Siegfried line? We uh, were where the, are these pillboxes? We were the left flank of the, of the United States Army. Uh, on, my, on my left was the British Army. So we were, this was, uh, 
Those pillboxes were in Germany, outside of Aachen, and they were part of the Siegfried Line, yes, they were part of the Siegfried Line. You've just described quite a bit of fighting. You lost two men shot by snipers. Uh, were you wounded yourself again? Yeah, I was wounded three times altogether. Was this another uh, Purple Heart for you? Was that? Were, were you awarded another Purple Heart? Three of them were awarded. Uh, at this particular time? Uh, no, I, uh, when I, I wasn't, was I wounded there? Where the hell was I wounded? Uh, well, I was wounded on the Rhine River and I was wounded, not a, I didn't get wounded any, on, this, on this operation at all, not there. It was later on I got wounded. Your outfit then is headed directly into Germany and uh, did you cross the Rhine at this point? Oh, no, 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 no. This was early. The Ruhr was still in a way. Uh, and we, we were sent back to our division after the, the attack by the 30th Infantry. And so we now rejoined our, our division. And we are now operating, I was now operating as a part of the division. And we were set up to go after the Ruhr, but the, the bulge started. And so our division was shipped down down south to the to the okay. Of the so we're in, we're in the winter of forty four. Forty four. Right. Let's talk about uh, your equipment that you had. It's cold. <laughs> it's winter in Germany. It, a tough, very tough winter. Did you have adequate clothing? Did no. your men have it? No. Why not? We, we had we had overcoats, which were useless to an infantry soldier. You can't run with that goddamn thing. And they came out with the uh, the Eisenhower jacket, but that came out later. Yeah. So uh, we were we were. I said I think I used had three sweaters on and a couple of shirts, oversized shirts on, and that was my my protection. We didn't have any white clothes. Uh, they, they never realized they were going to use, need white clothes. They thought the war was going to be over by Christmas. And so they didn't have any white uh, camouflage clothes. So we used to steal clothes off of uh, German uh, uh, laundry lines and use the <laughs> underwear for, for anything that was white. We would use use to camouflage ourselves in the snow because the snow was uh, deep. What did you, as an officer, do to keep your men warm? Fires mostly, small fires, uh, and but and then we uh, the main thing in, in in the bulge was to get your shoes off and get your socks off. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you got trench foot, and man, you don't want to get trench foot. And so we we made sure that everybody took their shoes and socks off every night, and I try to get the men to manipulate them with their hands to uh, uh, make sure the blood was flowing right, and this helped a lot. Getting warm, yeah, you went into houses I mean, if they were there and lit the stoves or whatever was going. And if you could get inside, which there was a lot of opportunity to do that. And mm -hmm. if we were on the line in foxholes, we would leave men often enough to go back to the back to a house and get warmed up a little bit. But that was about all you could do. The Battle of the Bulge centered around a place called Bastogne, um, or the this was a besieged town. What did your outfit do during all this? Uh, well, we what, was, what, what was your objective? We were south of Bastogne. The first objective was to stop the Germans. Uh, Patton wanted to let them go all the way to, the, to, to Paris and then cut them off and mm -hmm. destroy them. But Eisenhower wouldn't go along with that. So we were in the town of Marche. We were reported to be captured by the Germans, but they never got Marche. And our job was simply to stop them, stop the German army there, and which we did. And I guess where I got wounded the first time. Now this is the second time now. Uh, at the town of Houghton, little town of Houghton, uh, got hit by uh, shrapnel from a German tank. And, uh, and I was taken back. I went back to the, the first aid station, so I'd, I was out of the war for four weeks or three or four weeks back at the hospital in, in Belgium. You must have been hit pretty bad. Tell us about the, the kind of medical uh, service you got. 
once you got off the line, once you got to the aid station, it was tremendous. They, they were wonderful. Their job was to get you back as fast as they could, get you under uh, the best care that they had, and to do it as quickly as possible, which they did. Where were you taken to? Uh, I, the, the hospital in Belgium, wherever the hell the name a, was. A real hospital? A real hospital. This was a Belgian hospital that the Army took over. And uh, we, had good, we had good care there. As a matter of fact, uh, Christmas Eve, I was there Christmas Eve, and, and they come out with some medication. <laughs> it was a shot of bourbon. <laughs> you felt better already. I felt better after that. <laughs> How many guys were uh, being brought in when you were? Lots of tr uh, wounded, injured men? Well, I came back with a, on, a, on, a, on a, uh, an ambulance, and the ambulance was full. So how many more ambulances came out, I don't know. I know we, at that point where I was, we lost our company commander, our executive officer, me. We had no officers left in my company. And uh, a sergeant took over. And then a, and they sent an officer come up from battalion and they, they retreated back to Marche. Uh, but, and then I don't know what happened after that because I wasn't there. Were you fully conscious when this was happening to yeah, you? Yeah, everything I was conscious all the way through. Did you go through a process called triage? Did doctors look at you and decide that you were fixable? <laughs> no, 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 I, I didn't go any through that. I went straight back. There, were, uh, there hadn't been that much action up until that point. It was just the Germans met us and then that started the action. And so there, there wasn't too many back there, if I can remember. I, I ended up in the officer's ward anyway, which was a little bit of heaven <laughs> after what I was on. You said this was uh, Christmas Eve, and right. right after Christmas the weather broke, the skies and cleared, right. and so the, you got an aerial support. Right. Uh, what happened when you went back to your I went own back troops? to my outfit, and uh, uh, we attacked. Uh, we were in the attack all the way up to the, the meet up with the. Uh, I guess it was the Third Army that we we met up with. With Patton's troops. Yeah. and uh, that was the end of the bulge as far as we were concerned. Mm -hmm. Germans were back in, back in Germany. Uh, we did them a lot of damage as they were retreating, but, but we could have done a lot more. At this point, this is, uh, well, we're into 45 now. Yeah. We've crossed over into the new year. Yeah. How many of your original friends were with you, the guys from your original outfit? Any? I don't think there was any. Because no. you joined a new, whole new bunch when you came out of OCS. Right. That was a whole new operation, yeah. And those guys I had trained with down in New Orleans, uh, they're, they're mostly all gone. Then. And it was, you know, the replacements came up. And, we got so that we didn't even want to know who the replacements were because they would go so fast. They were killed. Uh, we had killed, wounded, disappeared. Uh, and after, after the bulge, we, uh, we were sent back to Germany, northern Germany where we were before, back to, to take the, the Ruhr River. So we are in the town of Galen Kirken, Linden, and uh, the division, along with the rest of the American Army, at, attacked to get to the uh, to uh, go across the Ruhr River, because they had they, the Germans had busted the dams before the bulge, so that nobody could move anywhere there. Uh, but by now they had dried up, and so we were able to go across the the Ruhr River. The Royal River was a surprise to the Germans. We got there, only a few men were killed in that, killed in the attack boats. And then when we got across the Royal, instead of continuing on forward against the Germans, we turned north, and they were building their defense is up forward of us, and we were we were going up to the side, and uh, so we we surprised the hell out of them. And. We were uh, in the. Uh, we were advancing, but I, I wasn't up at the front, um, and we were just simply marching along with the advancing units, and uh, the division loaded men on tanks, 
and drove the tanks down the main roads heading to the Rhine River and only stopped when they ran into a fight and the, the other troops coming back up would take care of the, of the resistance and they just kept them tanks rolling. And uh, we finally ended up in Krefeld, which was the largest German city on this side of the Rhine that we went into. And from Krefeld, we were to, we were to uh, the Germans were going across the Rhine River and, I, and uh, Ralph was given the task of stopping them at, one, at, at getting one of the bridges across the Rhine and the town of Hamburg. And it was a night attack. Hamburg? Hamburg, not Hamburg. Not Hamburg. Yeah, okay. Hamburg. Yeah. And uh, it was on this side of the Rhine. And, uh, and I got wounded there. I got, I got shot through the chest. How? It's a, a, a sniper? I, I don't, we don't know where it Somebody came from. Somebody shot you. Yeah, yeah. In the chest? In the chest, right, right through here, yeah. That's kind of close. Oh, yeah, very close. <laughs> very, very close. Me and, me and uh, President, what's the, 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 the actor, what's his name? The ex-president, the actor, who's the actor? Reagan. Huh? Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Reagan, yeah, Reagan. He got shot through the chest, too. You know? So me and Ray. He forgot yeah. to duck too. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that was that's it. a kind of serious wound. What's that? That's a kind of serious wound. Yeah. 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 What did they do with you? Uh, well, the worst part of it was getting back. And we were behind, almost behind German lines, getting me back from from where I was hit, back to the aid station, and they sent up a jeep from a battalion. And the, my guys carried me out of where, where I was wounded back to the jeep, and the jeep took me back to the aid station. And from then, it was, it was nothing. Were you conscious? Yes. You knew what was going on? Yes. Did you think, my God, I'm going to die, or this is my ticket home? No. You know, the only thing I thought about, how the hell am I going to get out of here? I mean, we're, we're, we're at night. We'll be uh, in German territory. Uh, my guys were all scared. They were, they were get, going to get into a fight. And, and I, I, how am I going to get out of this place where I was at? Uh, my guys took care of that. And they, they carried me back. As a matter of fact, going back, the German tank was shooting at us. Every time they stood up, they became silhouetted against the sky and the tanks shot up. <laughs> and they dropped me. <laughs> that didn't hurt. No offense. <laughs> Yeah, that hurt a little bit. Yeah. Where did they take you to, Jim? They took me back to the battalion aid station, which is your first is this a, stop. A mass station? Huh? Mass? No, 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 no. no. This is battalion. This is our battalion real, aid station. Real yeah, aid there, station. Yeah. Yeah. It's only a small operation. Where they didn't have any even doctors. They just had medical per people. And from there, I was shipped back to a. I was shipped back to a hospital. Oh no, I was shipped back to a field station. And that was a nice experience. We back to the field station. I was put in the officer's ward, and this hospital unit had just arrived in Germany. They just come over from the States, and I woke up. They operated on where they, they, they uh, I don't know what, the, yeah, they, they clean out the wound and they, and they closed it up, and, and then they put me to sleep. But when I woke up, there was a, a nurse powdering this leg, and there was another nurse washing me down over here and another this over here combing my hair. Hey, where the hell am I in heaven? <laughs> you died and you went to heaven, yeah. <laughs> died and went to heaven. Uh, but no, I didn't. It was, it was, it was great though. They, they took real good care of me. Then from there I went back to a hot German hospital which was taken over by the Americans and then from then on back to the States. How'd you get back to the States, Jim? Uh, see, I was in a hospital and I, I applied for a leave to Ireland. I went to Ireland for a week. And while I was in Ireland, the war was over, May 8th. And then I went back to, to the hospital. I came back on a hospital ship. I landed in New York. Had a great time in New York. When you first signed up, uh, you, you went in at, at, uh, through, through the National Guard. What was your commitment to the Army? Till the war was over, or four years, or what? Was well, it three year enlistment? Three years. Mm. So you, when you're on this hospital ship, you didn't think this is headed west again, and I've already done this. <laughs> Did you no, think you wait, might go wait. back to the Pacific? 
And they were, yeah, they were planning to go back to the Pacific, but then, then the war was over, over there pretty soon. And so no more Pacific. They would have sent me into the Pacific, infantry officer, sure. Yeah, with a lot and of the they would have three purple me, hearts. Huh? They would have give, given me a company and made me a, made me a company commander probably. Were you, uh, was that the end of your army career? You were discharged? I, I don't know what my thinking was then. I know I didn't want any more part of the army. I wanted out. I wanted to go to school, and I, which I did. And uh, I became an engineer, a manufacturing engineer, uh, which is what I wanted at that time. So I not, didn't think anymore about an army. I was wounded pretty bad, so I didn't think I'd do much in the army. If I, even if I stayed in, they'd probably give me a desk job someplace. I, I didn't want that. Before you went into combat against the Germans, you'd heard a lot about the German army. All of us did. Um, what did you think of the, uh, the German army And after you had been in combat with them? They were good. They were good, but they, when they were, they were messed up. They they didn't know what to do. Our army, and a private can take over the platoon if he has to. In their army, they're given orders from the officer, and, and if they, if anything happened to destroy that, then they they were useless. They were not. They were, but they were terrific on defense. They would fight up until you came into the front door and then they would surrender. So they were tough. But at least they would surrender, yeah. unlike anybody you met in the Pacific. The Japanese didn't never surrender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the equipment that you had and the, the equipment you saw the Germans using? Can you compare uh, the two? Uh, the German machine gun was better than ours. We had the light machine gun. Our light was good, but our heavy 30 caliber was too goddamn heavy. Our bazooka was useless, our bazooka, compared to their bazooka. There's a story there, you want to hear that story. We were in, in an area where we were training to cross rivers, and so they were doing it at one company at a time, and the rest of us were just standing around watching. And there was a German tank there, so I went over to see what the tank looked like. And while there, I spotted a German Panzerfaust. This is a German the German uh, bazooka. And it's a long tube, about two foot long, and they, a head goes on it, and this head was off, so I said, oh, I've got, a, I've got the propellant part, but the, and it, no, it must have been fired, so I'm looking it all over, and it had a sight laying down on it, and I picked the sight up, and you look across the sight, across the, 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 the charge that was on the end of the, of the tube, and that's how you would fire it. And so I did, and I fired it. <laughs> it was loaded. <laughs> and the, everything got quiet because of the explosion, you know. And one of my guys yelled, out, hey, Mac, hold up your arms. And I had one of them ponchos on, you know, with a wrap yeah. around your neck. <laughs> up my arm, and a big hole <laughs> in front of the whole battalion. <laughs> nice guy. Just giving the troops a lot of confidence. <laughs> so I knew how the pants if I was worked. <laughs> That'd be a funny wound, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, good thing there was nothing behind me. Everybody really behind me. Hard one to explain. Yeah, they would have got. They would have got blasted. But that was a hell of a weapon, the Panzerfaust. You had quite a quite a ride in in the army. Quite a career, starting uh, out in the Pacific before anybody else. Wound up getting three Purple Hearts in northern Germany. The war's over. You look back on all of that. Was there a most memorable experience out of all of that that you could tell us about? Something that stands out more than anything else? Not really, because you've got to realize that I was a I was a kid from South Boston. Didn't have anything. Um, and nine kids in the family. So my father was a drunk. So. We had no money, and we never went anywhere, never did anything. Uh, so in the Army now, I was aboard ship, I went to Australia, I went to Europe. I had quite an experience traveling all over the world. I met a lot of people, I did a lot of things. So the whole experience to me was probably 
uh, at that time I thought of it as a good experience, good for me, and uh, I didn't think any more about it. Now I, but I know <laughs> when I got back to South Boston, I took the uniform off, and nobody knew me. I wasn't an officer anymore. I was <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> That was a shock. That was a shock. Yeah, I can imagine it was. Yeah. And now I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm not a high school graduate. I don't have it. What what trade do I have? I had no trade. I'm good at killing. That's about all. Uh, and so what I, I decided to go to school. That's what I did. I'm I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, uh, but when you went to school, did did you go on the GI Bill? Did yes. You, and and uh, you. T you Took engineering, is that what you said? Yes, mechanical engineering. And where, what school did you go to? I went to Franklin Tech in downtown yeah. Boston. Yeah. And then I graduated from Northeastern University, a night school. Yes. So it paid off, but you paid dearly for it with yeah, three was, Purple you know, Hearts and lost a lot of good friends. And I, I got my degree out of Northeastern when I was 31, married with a baby. <laughs> but that shows persistence. <laughs> Was there any, in all of this, where you got hurt and a lot of people got hurt, but was there a, a humorous experience that you can tell us about? A humorous experience? Yeah, something funny. Was there anything funny over that time? Well, we, we made, made everything funny because that's, that's the only way you could survive. Uh, Think of uh, bring up a, a, an experience at the beginning, I don't know. Not really, I can't think of one off my mind. You'll think of it on the way home I'll today. Have to, on the way home, I'll come up with a dozen of them. <laughs> with what rank and what decorations were you discharged? Well, I had all the, the campaign ribbons, American campaign, South Pacific campaign, European campaign, two battle stars, two battle stars on the uh, South Pacific campaign, Purple Heart with three battle stars, uh, three clusters and the, the Bronze Star. What was the Bronze Star for? The Bronze Star, actually, to me, it's, 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 it's worthless now because they gave it to us because we were in the combat area in Europe. If you were in a combat area in Europe, you got the, ball, you got the Bronze Star. If you were an infantryman, you had to be, a, you could, could be an artilleryman too, I guess, or a tanker. But the, so everybody got it, so it doesn't mean anything. I don't think it was quite that easy, but uh, you did <laughs> well, a lot it was just, to it was deserve a, it. I was their medal, that's what it is. Uh, and, and what, uh, you were a sergeant and then a lieutenant? That's right. First, did you... First got, lieutenant, I, when okay, I Okay, good up. for you. Uh, did you join any reserve units after you came home? No. Okay. Because of my wound, I figured I was useless. I couldn't do it. So. How about any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah, DAV, I belong to. Are you currently a member of the Veterans Organization? Yeah. Okay. What were your feelings about coming home? You came home to South Boston, took off your lieutenant's bars and uh, looked around. That was a disappointment. I mean, I was, uh, uh, oh, God, what am I doing now, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm nothing. And uh, so I, I decided I had to be something, so I went to school. So you went to school. What kind of reception did you get in your community? Well, it was a good reception. Uh, good reception. No, uh, you know, it was a popular war. Uh, Germans started it, and Japan started it. So, fighting them was was a, was a good deal. You weren't married yet, but uh, yes, I was. I was were? married in between your uh, South Pacific and Europe. I get married. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Yeah, I missed that. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, did you sit down with your wife or your? folks and talk to them about what you would experienced, what you'd seen and done? No, not really, no. They don't, they're not interested. No. Well, <laughs> I'll bet they would be. You, you prob probably. I don't know whether they'd sit and listen to you or not. But they, well, you can tell they, when you, you take this tape Talk home. to a veteran and he, he won't say anything either. <laughs> Jim, how important to you was serving in the military? Serving in the... How important was your military experience? Well, I think it was the biggest experience of my life, naturally. I, I, I think about it all the time. And uh, I was mm, glad to have gone through it, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. 
about the way it comes down. I think everybody, everybody is, is wants to know how he's going to act under uh, those kind of conditions. You wonder are you going to be yellow or you're going to be okay. And eh, I was okay. No hero, but I was okay. Oh, and somebody who attacks a blockhouse at night has, has my adm admiration. I, I can tell you that. Do you feel, you got a college degree out of it and a good yes. education, but other than that, do you feel serving in the military affected your life? For the better. I, I think it made me see that life was not uh, that simple. It was complicated. And I think I had the experience, traveling experience, and, and what I had done made me a better person, you, stronger person. You had uh, the experience very few Americans in the armed forces had, or relatively few. You fought against both the Japanese and the Germans, mm -hmm. maybe some Italians if you were in southern Germany. Um, what did you think then about the war you were in? And what do you think now, looking back at it? Well, you know, the funny thing is, I don't think I thought a hell of a lot about the war. It was there, that's all I was to it. Uh, and you, you did what you had to do. Uh, now, uh, some of the experiences we have gone through makes war a little stupid. Nothing has ever, uh, ever accomplished with the war. I never could understand the Germans. We fought them all the way back to, well, I, I went all the way to the Rhine River and we were destroying their houses all around them. They had no uh, idea they, of winning the war. And why were they still fighting? I have no idea. Just because Hitler said so. These guys were obeying Hitler. And they were fighting hard. They were tough. Uh, even at this time, going into Germany. and. I, I can't understand their mentality. And uh, now, you know, you're dropping bombs. Like I was reading the other day about it, it's okay to drop bombs and s kill civilian babies and things like that, but uh, it, it's okay if your government says so. So Hitler was the government. He said so. Was that all right? No, of course it wasn't. So I, we have to get a new understanding of what we are and where we're going and how we're going to get there. You told us a minute ago about uh, the reaction of your friends and your family when you came home. Could you think that uh, about the reception you got, the reception that the guys got when they came back from Korea or Vietnam? Well, uh, I, I could never understand the reception they got. I mean, I mean, these were soldiers fighting in a foreign land. They come back in, they get spit on. Uh, and that, that I can't understand. It just, just doesn't make any sense at all. But I think it, it uh, woke up uh, thinking about war. Just because the government says to go to war, should we go to war? I think there's a lot more thinking has to be done about going to war because I don't think it accomplishes anything. The Japanese went to, went to war against us. What did it accomplish them? It got their cities wiped out, got the millions of men killed. It didn't accomplish anything. And so I think we have to learn more about how to survive in this world of ours. We're, we're only savages ourselves. <laughs> and we have to learn to get civilized, I think. Is there some thought or incident that you've never told anybody about what you did in the service? that you would like to include in this tape? Yeah, but I don't want to include it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, I guess the last question. Is there anything that I haven't asked you here today uh, about your military service or your life in the military that you would like to tell us today or people who will be looking at this tape a long time from now? Well, my opinion of the American soldier was that he, he never learned anything. He had to learn the hard way. And all my men, I taught, taught them how to uh, stay undercover. And they always ended up walking on the ridge line so they could get shot at by the enemy. And 
camouflage, they didn't know how to camouflage. The Japanese and the Germans were excellent, and we, we never knew how to camouflage. That's, in other words, they didn't learn the basic parts of fighting. Well, the, the American soldier wasn't interested in becoming a professional soldier. He was only interested in getting the job done and come back home. And the American attitude, I can do anything anyway. So they didn't have to be trained out of be soldiers. They were soldiers to begin with. Uh, well, this is not true. They, did, they still just didn't understand basics. And I guess they understand basics about living in the same way today. That's, that's about it. Jim McCarthy. <laughs> Thank you. Very Thanks much. very much.